stay there for a second. I want to go to Circa Ní Lachlan. Uh, Circa, hi, how are oh, you? Sure. And so, Thank you, Stephen. Circa is from the uh, sports uh, spokesperson for the Countess. Circa, good afternoon to you. Hi, Niall, how are you? Um, there is an argument <clears throat> to be made, Circa, that when we focus on, say, this particular story of the darts player or the Irish dancing player, that we're actually deluding mm-hmm. the argument. In other words, that yes, there's an argument to be made when it comes to a sport that involves athletics. And by the way, there has been some evidence that male darts players think differently to female darts players. For example, there's an article here, men are better at throwing sports uh, due to concentration skills, and this is according to MDX Academic and X-Darts Pros. But realistically, are we diluting the argument? Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, you know, any, ca- any sport that has developed a category in which women um, should be competing only against other women clearly has seen a need for that category. And that category should be protected. So, for example, in darts, they have an open category. Anyone can compete, can compete in it. But they've also protected the category for the women's series in recognition of the fact that for many different reasons, women need a category in which they can excel when they don't have to compete against men. I'm just looking up at some research here, and it does say that uh, there's, there was a PhD study done on this kind of thing, and there was also another um, publication in 2007 which talked about sex differences in darts. And it says that uh, male players recruited from a largely small pool of club players were superior to the best female players selected from a much larger pool at international level. So you can see this shows that that's kind of what Stephen was talking about there, where they won't always win, but the mediocre males will compete at the elite level in a female competition. And that's why the differences are. It's not that every man will beat every woman or every or that they will always win. It's that they will perform at a much higher level within that pool because of their physical advantages. Mm. So stuff like, uh, like you were talking about their stance, uh, stature, arm reach, throwing force even. Even the fact that they can lean forward further and get more power behind the dart means that it will be more accurate when it hits the board. So there are sex differences, but even where the sex difference is not there and it was purely social, that category still was created to protect women and give them an opportunity. So it's a, it's an inclusive category for women and it shouldn't include anybody who is not female. That's the basis of it. And similarly with Irish dancing, there are separate categories. In some c- competitions, you will have o- open where boys and girls will dance together. And in some, it should be based on sex. If they've decided it's based on sex, it should be based on sex, not gender. Gender identity or somebody's self-proclaimed identity, because that's non-verifiable. We, we, and it's not... Particularly, the male okay. advantage is not negatiable in any meaningful way. So I, I'm going to surprise you now by saying I agree with Stephen on his first point there. Was he said that those athletes, it's the governing bodies allowed those athletes to enter. And it's the governing body's responsibility to protect the athletes within the categories, and they are letting women down. So the fact that an individual boy or man has entered the competition reflects poorly, I would say, on that mm. boy or man. But it reflects so much worse on the governing bodies who should be. But they said the organisers, by the way, of the, the dancing, for example, the CLRJ, said it's committed to creating a safe and inclusive environment for every dancer in our community. Dancers enter competitions that align with their gender identity, and that was voted yeah. for in a membership vote, by the way, because they did actually have a yeah, motion seeking to enforce dancers vote, compete. The membership vote, I, I believe, came after a half a day training by um, transgender inclusion advocates. So they haven't had an unbiased. Uh, presentation, for example, or they haven't actually looked at how this impacts women and girls. When they talk about safe and inclusive, they only mean safe and inclusive for boys because it is not safe or inclusive for a girl to be told that her needs, her well-being, her rights are less than those of a boy. Okay, let me, just, uh, okay, well, let me go back to Stephen on the girls. relation to that. Stephen, you know, men have larger hearts, greater lung capacity, uh, greater muscle mass. I'm looking here at uh, where it t- talks about it. On more, average. More red blood cells, higher bone density, less body fat on average. Uh, I know a lot of men with a lot of body fat. All of which give males, particularly when it comes to darts, all of which give males performance advantages over females. In other words, nobody <laughs> asked the women you know, and the point Circa's making is that it's all well and good, you know, for an organisation to say, oh, look, we're going to be inclusive and we're going to allow anybody that aligns with the gender or gender identity in. But they didn't ask the women about this. And what about their rights? Well, arguably, they had a more unbiased uh, ability to cast a vote when it came to 
I don't know, I assume it was the darts that the, that voted to allow the the trans inclusion policy um, mm. because they were made aware of. You well, know, well, why not go to the open to categories? Why they're happening in the vote in the first place? But but circus point sure, why why know, not enter the open category if that's what you want to do? Well, why doesn't everybody compete in an open category? Because then? that would be ridiculous, wouldn't it? Well, why then do we need an open category? Because, if, because if, I, if, we, if we had open categories in everything, in other words, there was no male and female categories and just open categories, well, then men would walk away with nearly everything. And sorry, Circa, as a woman, I, I apologize for saying that to you. But so, unfortunately, so, we have to face the facts that men hold most of the world true, records. Though. Like 14, 15 year old boys are out competing elite Olympian women in athletics. That's why the categories exist in the first place. If it was open, if every single sport had an open category, no women would win. Ever. If Can you care to prove that? Out, you know, it just send, yeah, send me, sure. email me, email me or text me or put it up on Twitter a link to yeah, say no that problem. teenage boys are outproducing, outperforming female Olympians. Yeah. If you check on boysversuswomen.com, you'll find a huge array of stats that prove what I just said. If you look at the there goes my afternoon. <laughs> uh, but, but, okay. Steve, <laughs> Stephen, you also, advocate. Even at under eight and nine, there's differences. We looked, I looked at a presentation from um, a conference last year which, where a man, uh, he had looked at, sports physiologists had looked at the records across loads of different um, national and international competitions between all pre-puberty boys and girls. And the boys would win about two-thirds of all the medals if the categories were open. In some sports, they would win almost all the medals. So even before puberty, you have this difference and it's accelerated by puberty and it's not negatable. Now, I will say what Stephen said was true is that somebody's on testosterone suppression for a long time. It does impact their muscular performance, but only at, uh, only against other males. It, does not, it will never, ever make that person into a woman and it won't make their sporting performance equivalent to a woman. So, yes, there may be a need for some kind of reorganization of categories for people who have who have impacted their own sporting ability. But that should never come at the expense of women and girls. You know, their category is there for females. If a category is needed for males who now can't compete at the same level they did previously because of the choices that they have made for whatever therapies, then that needs to be looked at, but not at the expense of women and girls. That's my point. So, you know, they, they, they will lose some muscle mass. They will lose some hemoglobin, and that will affect some of their performance, but never will it ever turn them into women or make them compete at an equivalent level to women. And that's the point. So what you have is mediocre, mid-range athletes in the male performance level who will suddenly be competing at near the top of the female level. So if you had a case where an actual elite male athlete decided to enter the female category, he would write the floor with anybody. We're not seeing them win because they're not actually elite athletes yet that are doing this. But if they were, they would 100% win everything. If, if they're mediocre athletes, maybe three or four women have a chance of beating them, maybe 20, 19 out of whatever at the age of 14. But, but never will, will there be an equivalence. It's not possible to make somebody change sex. It's just not possible. And the sex differences are real and they are permanent. And they, are, they exist from the moment of conception that's determined at conception whether you're going to be male or female. You, then it's expressed in utero by development. There's testosterone already impacting the male development even when they're growing in their mother's womb. It's identified when they're born. They look at the baby and they say, yes, this is a boy or this is a girl. But every single cell in that person's body expresses their sex. Every hormone level, okay. every heartbeat, every breath, everything is impacted by whether they are male or female. Okay, I'm looking at a website here. It's called boysversusmen.com. 2016, uh, 2016 track and field uh, and swimming events. Boys versus women. Boys won 86 medals. Girls won eight. So, yeah. I, I mean, Stephen, that kind of says it to you. And there, I don't know if it's an urban myth or not, but there's, wasn't there a story going around that after the, the American um, World Cup team, the, the female World Cup team, uh, played a, an under-15s boys team and lost? Yeah. So the Australian, it, 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 the yeah, Australian it, women's soccer team as well had the same. They play, played in a warm-up. They've called off the match because the scoreline was so embarrassing. Horrendous. They were under-16 boys. Yeah. 
So I, it's not it's not some sort of myth or you know Stephen that men generally right. are better athletically than women. They yeah. are, and that's not disparaging to women. Women are just built differently, and that's why they have to be categorized separately. Now I do understand that to some degree it dilutes the argument talking about things like chess or darts or whatever it is. But there is evidence there that they do think differently. There is evidence there from pros that the reason they're categorised is because they play differently. Uh, but hang on, because I want to go to a dancer as well. Uh, Sharon, hi, how are you? Hi, I'm good, Niall. How you doing? Just hey, back you? from a dance yesterday and I'm thinking of it all in dancing terms. Okay. Thank God it, it doesn't exist in dancing. Okay. But I'll tell you one... Sorry, your, what sort of dancing ahead, do you do? What sort of dancing do you do? I, I do it all now. I okay. do it all. I do ballroom, Latin, Ciroc, blues, salsa. I, I do it all. I do it all because I, I love it. But at the dance yesterday, something did stri- strike me. Um, when I'm Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I lost it. Do you know what? Go ahead. Um, I'm, I'm a pretty good lead, so I think I'm just going to ask some of the ladies up. And that's what I did because, you know, not, not everybody can lead, male or female. I know, I used to do ballroom dancing when I was a kid. Yeah, and I figured out I'm a great lead and I said, I'm just going to, when I'm not dancing with with a man, I'm going to ask the ladies up and my God, it it enhanced the dancing for me, you know? And and that's fine, by the way. And I've seen that you used to see that in ballroom yeah. dancing all the time when there wasn't enough boys there, for example, girls would take the lead. Or vice versa, by the way. I've seen boys when I used to do ballroom dancing. I was only 12 or 13 at the time. No. And they would take the female part, right? And that's perfectly fine too. But when we're talking about competitions that do have yeah. strict, you know, ladies and men's categories, is it fair to have a man or a biological male who identifies as a woman in that category? I think in dancing it's perfectly fine, as we saw with Jason winning the glitter ball. He was by he was he was one of the best dancers there. There were one or two others as well. David was fabulous, but I mean that that they, he deserved that trophy. He was great, but when it comes to darts now, I mean I can't argue with Sorica. I agree with you know pretty much everything she says. With darts though. Um, I don't know if I agree with it, but that's because but, but it doesn't matter. But it doesn't matter whether we agree with it. Here's the, see, here's the thing that I'm trying to say to Stephen: Does it matter whether yeah. we agree with it or not? The point is, there is categories, and whoever set those categories up originally did it first, either as Stephen rightly pointed out, maybe social reasons, apart from anything else, uh, you know, uh, or they set yeah. it up for, because they looked at statistics and said, "Well, look, any time we put men and women together, the men are always winning. So let's have a separate category for women, and let's have a separate separate category for men to give women you know, to be fair to women." And that's why we have the categories. Which is only so, right. Yeah, yeah. So, on a point of principle, even if they were both equal at the sport or whatever the skill is, on a point of principle, is it not wrong to have somebody in who identifies as a man, even if it doesn't involve skill, or even if it doesn't involve you know being athletic or whatever it is? Is it just not wrong on a point of principle? When it comes to athleticism, yeah, I think I think you're probably right. You know, these people have studied it and. The muscle mass and all of that, especially when it comes to running, swimming, all of those things. Mm. Yeah. Steve, well, what do you do? do Stephen, you you, Stephen you've gone suspiciously quiet for some reason. I don't, I'm not too sure why. Heaven forbid I should let a woman speak. <laughs> but, <laughs> Thank you, Stephen. Much appreciated. But Stephen, I, I mean, look, okay, you speak every single, well, on a regular basis. Um, I won't go into what you do for a living, but but I know you're a volunteer as well, and you speak to a lot of people from the LGBT community, and you speak to a lot of people, young people, who, of course, are in the community as well. I mean, what what's their feelings on this particular aspect of the conversation or debate? I think a lot of people uh, are, you know, rightly kind of unsure as to what way things should go. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you know, categories were created because women demanded to be able to compete uh, in bowling or tennis or whatever other sport. And we said, oh, actually, that's a good idea. You should be let do that. So here you go. Um, And now the whole idea of, well, you know, this 10-year-old and that 10-year-old running in a race are now at odds with each other because one of them has an advantage over the other, you know, Mm -hmm. and they see it as as stupid, really, more than 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 anything else in that, you know, they're 10. It doesn't make a difference. They're running in a school sports day. What difference does it make? And they kind of see the same thing as, you know, 
the na- the local, national, and international competitions as well. In that, these people are, you know, at the peak of their performance, they're able to do what most people can't do. They should be allowed to do it the way they're the way they want to do it. And the governing bodies are reacting to it by saying, well. You know, we have to try and balance everything and keep it as fair as is possible. So this is the best compromise that we can come up with because every majority has to yield to a minority in some categories, in some ways, socially, legally, uh, ethically, whatever. And the majority of minorities have to yield to the majorities because, well, they hold all the power. I mean, Circa, and okay, let me ask just, just to go back to Circa. I can be gay okay. or not, or whether I can compete or not. Like, well, I'm being not, gay like, is up until just, very re- yeah. yeah, but v- up until very recently, if I wanted to, you know, join any branch of the civil service or compete on a sports team, I would be incompatible with the rest of the team because I'm gay. And I would be excluded from it. Well, that's unacceptable. I mean, and we all accept that's unacceptable. Yeah. I, I mean, Circa, just in relation to, you know, where, I just where... had one other thing I wanted to say, though. I mean, the whole notion that, in inverted commas, mediocre male athletes will transition so that they can perf- they can have higher achievements and recognition. They're not transitioning. They're mean... identifying. There's a difference. They're transitioning or identifying or whatever way you want to call it, because if they if they have to if they if they are going to be able to compete, they have to meet the governing body's recognition standards. Which means that Noah Lynn had to be at a stage in her transition uh, that met the Darts uh, Commission's okay. uh, rules to say that they can compete. And they've only been competing as a woman for two years. Okay, but sorry, just let me go back to Circa on that point. So uh, okay, I'll, I'll, but no, hang, hang on, Stephen, hang on a second. Circa, on that point in relation to organizations. My point is that. No, 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 Stephen, just, just, Stephen, just for two seconds. Hang on, I, wanna, I just want to establish something. My general point, because okay. my general point is that why are people saying that it is mediocre men who, seeking, you know. But it is. Better, better appreciation are going to transition and subject themselves to the entire world's public scrutiny of their transition because they in their can, life. Because, some, the, because some of them can make quite a substantial money out of from it. From that. Okay. Uh, and adulation. Uh, sorry, let me, let me just go to Circa. Sorry. Circa, in relation to governing bodies, uh, whether it be the GAA, whether it be the IRFU, whether it be whatever, the FAI, whatever, uh, where do the government bodies stand on this at the moment? And where do they currently say, for example, in Ireland, we'll take Ireland, for example. I know in the UK there's been some announcements in relation to cycling and other events where they won't yeah. accept it. But where do the Irish governing yeah. bodies stand on this? So it's mixed in Ireland. The IRFU have protected the category of female from, to female at birth, so some from the beginning. Um, and then there's others where they talk about um, not going through male puberty. There's others where there is uh, no policy. A lot, a lot of we're waiting for the Sport Ireland um, guidance on transgender and non-binary inclusion in sport to be released, which was released last Thursday. Um, and I think they were hoping to get some some clear guidance from that, which I don't know that it is very clear but um that that report i think will will lead a lot of governing bodies now to actually uh, put forward policies but for example the lgfa policy uh it allows any males over 12 um to play in ladies gaelic football and then there are certain caveats but they you know then there's a thing about risk assessment which talks about how uh, having a male player would not necessarily constitute a risk just because they're a male or, as they say, just because uh, from the mere pan- participation of a trans woman's participation or something like that. Whereas basically what they're saying is it'll only be in exceptional circumstances that would be a risk to women, whereas we would say um, that that it is an exceptional circumstance if you allow a male onto, onto the pitch, especially in something like ladies' gaily football where it's high risk of collision. Mm. Well, we've seen that already, um, haven't we? So they, yeah, there, they, so the they enacted that policy saying that they were mm. obliged by law and that is factually untrue. They were not in any way obliged to allow male players into their sport. And where does um, where does the law stand? The, where do the equality authority authorities stand on all this? So, so where's so the law? You can, so a person in Ireland can get a gender recognition certificate if they're over eighteen. Any person, no gatekeeping, no nothing that will say that they are now the opposite sex. Yeah, I can identify tomorrow um, as a woman. However, if I want to. yeah, yeah, you could, yeah. Um, 16, 17, 16, 17 and 18 year olds can do, 16, 17 year olds can do so with a bit more complicated process. There have been very few of those. Um, without that certificate, nobody is obliged to treat anybody in any way 
as if they are the opposite sex. With the certificate, it applies in certain instances, but there are exceptions under the Equality Act. And that means that where necessary, sex can be um, used as the, as the discriminating factor. So you can exclude on the basis of sex within sport or for privacy and dignity reasons. Um, where, So, for example, in private spaces, mm. uh, single sex, changing rooms, toilets, etc., wards, hospital wards, um, prisons. Now, that doesn't always happen, but it is lawful to make that discrimination. And it also, the Gender Recognition Act, as uh, Leisha says, it's a shield, it's not a sword. So it protects that person against discrimination um, on the basis of the fact that they are, have uh, a transgender identity. But it's not, it can't be used to force acceptance of that person. So, for example, the, the pronouns issue, you can't compel somebody to refer to you in the way that you want them to but they can't discriminate against you. So it's kind of two prongs, a little bit complicated. In terms of sport, the law does, does, isn't explicit, but there are two different acts that apply, the Gender Recognition Act and the Equalities Act. And the Equalities Act allows for discrimination okay. on the basis of sex. Okay, but, but, but look, sorry, I, I'm sorry just to cut you a little bit short there, because, uh, sorry, Sharon, was there yeah. something else you want to say just before I go to Cathy, because she's waiting, waiting ages there, I do apologise. Sorry. Um, yeah, the only thing I would say is that I don't think the, in dancing it applies. Mm. It really doesn't, because, you know, um, Jason proved that, and uh, I don't see why there would be any difference. Dance is an expression of, of the self, but if, whether they're made if dance, is, if dance is a competition, though, it involves some yeah. level of athleticism. There is stamina, there is strength, say, in terms of the jump yes. height, in terms of how I long know, you can, sorry, say, sorry. in Irish dancing, how long they can rally for, you know, how well they can maintain their performance through the whole yeah. uh, dance. There are also women plenty of women, who women have, men. have babies. Women have babies. Yeah. Oh, I mean, get women, over it. Well done. This... No, oh. listen, my point is that women have babies, okay? So um, women are strong, men are strong. In dancing, I really don't think that it matters whether they're male or female because they can both train, Agreed. you know? Okay, and- okay, well, well, hang on, and, and thank you for that, Sharon. I do apologise for cutting everybody a bit short, but I want to go to Cathy, mm-hmm. who's been waiting a long time, and I do apologise, Cathy. Uh, Cathy, good afternoon to you. Now, Cathy, you're the mum of a trans girl who detransitioned. Um, well, she desisted, so she didn't actually take any um, medication. But yeah, she was pretty serious about the whole thing. Okay, so she, she so at what age did she decide that she wanted to be a boy? Oh, I said probably eleven, around that kind of age, eleven and a half. But she didn't actually um, come out to me officially until she was thirteen and a half. Okay. So yeah. And then at what at what age was she when she decided? Actually, no, I've made a mistake. Pretty I, much. Well. She didn't. Re- she she helped. She decided with the help of me. So just before her fourteenth birthday, I say about a month before, um, I decided to do a little research on the whole thing, um, and I discovered what she actually believed and what they all believed. These trans activists, and I'm sure this is what Stephen believes too. But he he like they they have certain arguing tactics where they will try to appear quite reasonable, but they do actually believe that they, you can actually change sex for all intents and purposes. They believe that if you change your hormone profile and do various cosmetic surgery, you are you ha- for all intents and purposes have changed sex, and uh, they really believe that the, there's no reason why they shouldn't be treated as a woman. <laughs> you know, well, men shouldn't be treated as a woman. You know, for and, 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 and throughout the process, you you were determined not to affirm her identity as a as a boy. You didn't want to affirm her identity as a boy, I assume. No, I I never affirmed her identity, but she yeah. was actually. Uh, she did have um, comorbidities, so autism, ADHD. Okay. Um, she's actually a lesbian as well, um, okay. which is, these are, these are all factors that... Um, well, no, they are, they are factors, and we've seen the statistics in relation yeah. to autism and transgenderism, and it's not, a, it's not a coincidence, you know. I mean, um, obviously, people, some people are more vulnerable to ideas than others. Exactly. Uh, and, and, I, I would agree, and I think everybody would agree with that. Yeah. Okay, but, okay. So, so in relation... Not brainwashing yeah. people. Sorry, Stephen? I said we're not brainwashing people. You are, Stephen. You are can, you ask, can you tell me That's why your daughter dis- desisted? <laughs> ah, hilarious. You know, honestly, um, you know... Can you tell me, can you out. ask your daughter why she desisted? Uh, of course I did, Stephen. Of course. We had so many, why many did she desist? I'll tell you why, Stephen, because... Lack I of social acceptance. No, hang on, you've, you've, you've asked her a question. You, you've, Stephen, you've asked her a question. Let her answer it. There. You've okay. asked her a question. So, Let her answer it. So once I pointed out, uh, Niall, exactly what this cult consists of, so that you actually can't change sex. And, you know, my daughter had no idea that there was all these side effects with hormones. 
and um, that she would be sterile, that, you know, she, she thought that, she, that all these operations would actually turn her into a boy. And that's what they're actually told online and by their peers and by these little LGBT, you know, teen groups that they go to. They're told, they're told these lies. Um, that they're all, and uh, they're told that they'll be, they can, they will, talk, they, they say, they think they will actually pass the boy, and no one will notice that they're like a, a couple of feet shorter than all the real men that are around them, and that they're, you know, yeah, there are small men too, you know. I mean, I'm not that tall. There are small men, but then when when you actually see a group of trans people together, and um, you know, the, you see these teeny tiny little men, and uh, these giant women, you know, it's it's quite comical, really. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so you convinced her anyway, and 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 is she happy and embracing her femininity now? Oh, she's absolutely totally fine. But the thing is, so it's just, as far as you're both, concerned, it was a phase she went through. Hmm. And no, it was more than a phase. Um, I think I think she was brainwashed. Basically, that's exactly what Stephen said. Okay. Yes. Indoctrinated, I think, is the more common word used. Whatever, okay. whatever word you want to use. It's, it's I mean, St- Stephen. Yes. Okay, just, just and I'm going to come back to the sport in a second. But indoctrination is a huge part of this. It is a huge part of it. We've, we've seen, Stephen, the evidence. And I spoke to Kevin Lester uh, the other day, and we'll put that interview up actually tomorrow. But Kevin, or on Wednesday, Kevin Lester is a school teacher in England who was fired because he wouldn't confirm the identity or affirm the identity of a student who was a girl who wanted to be a boy. And he wanted her to enter a female maths competition. Now, the student herself didn't complain, by the way. It was one of her friends who made a complaint. He ended up in court and he lost his job. Uh, now, he did go to all the, the student safeguarding policy. He wanted to contact the parents, but the principal wouldn't let them and said the parents didn't need to know about it, which I thought was bizarre. Uh, anyway, because she still is a minor under the age of 18. But the point I was going to make in relation to, to these kind of situations is that we've seen uh, the evidence from schools where you would have one school that would have, you know, 10 or 20 people identifying as the opposite gender and some schools with none. And they say the reason for that is, and there is there's actual evidence there that it's a social contagion. And as I've said to you a hundred times, everything is a social contagion. Well, we're talking about yeah. the lives of children. The fact that, the I don't, I don't that mind. I don't. I don't mind wearing clothes. Is that I socially contagioned her to agree with me in some point of view. She heard what I said. She agreed with it. That is social contagion. No, 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 no. Okay, but when you, when you, it's okay. We can have social contagion when it comes to things like hairstyles or fashion oh, or things like that because that doesn't affect somebody's life directly. I mean, I used to have long blonde curly hair and wore, you know, denims with Pink Floyd embroidered on the back of it when I was seventeen. Didn't mean I was going to be like that for the rest of my life. But when you so, no. when you have a social contagion that directly affects or impacts somebody's health, whereby they're t- they start taking testosterone or uh, or puberty blockers or whatever. But your autonomy with. to make your decision and how you presented yourself is the same as a as a trans person's autonomy to make a decision about how they present themselves. Nobody I know is saying that you can change your sex. Everyone well, I know Stephen, is saying that you Stephen, can change your gender children. presentation to present as the person that you feel that you are. The same way as I everybody know, I know, else. Stephen, I, I, know, I know that that's your official line, and I know that that's what you're, you, 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 you say. It's my people, opinion, and of, it's the fact uh, that I know from children, the people that I speak uh, yes, to. Yes, and, and you know also, Stephen, all of these children truly believe this. Uh, and if you talk to them, they truly believe it. And they will go to therapists, and they will go to this person and that yeah, person. Yeah, I know plenty of trans them, kids. None of them, none of them dis- disabuse them of this concept. None of them turn around and say, actually, you can't change sex. And uh, you, all you can do is just do a bit of cosmetic surgery and take a few uh, cross-sex hormones. But they never actually are told the truth by adults. Nobody is actually like trying to force a child into a transition of any kind, whether it's but socially, Stephen, physically, or, or, or chemically. Either. I don't know. Have you read the reports from Tavistock? Just for a point. I know, I know, I'm Stephen. I'm asking you. Have you read the reports from Tavistock? Healthcare for anybody under the age of eighteen, and anybody over uh, the Stephen, age of eighteen has you, a minimum of a ten-year wait list to even be considered. Have you read the reports from Tavistock? Have you read the files from WPATH? Have you read I've all read of those? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. And, okay. and, and Niall, it might be an idea for you to have a look at all of these people and how they get hormones uh, privately. So there's a, tons and tons of young people in Ireland, both under the age of 18 and over, that get their hormones quite easily. Like gender GP, you just ring up, you can do an online appointment for 300 euros, and they send you a prescription, and off you go. And if you if you want to, there's nobody doing device, that in gender GP anymore. No, 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 not that's exactly right, Stephen. So they were right up until they were up until that was stopped. And by the way, can I point out to everybody listening? It's, it's illegal to order any prescription drugs online, by the way, in this country. Uh, but people, I know people do it all the time. Uh, we were only talking about it recently with abortion pills. Uh, but, but sorry, I want to get back to the sports argument, Cathy, if I can. And I'm, and I'm sorry your daughter went through that. And I'm, I'm glad, you know, that you feel happy and she feels happy now with the result at the end of it, okay? And, and I know you're speaking at an event very shortly in relation to that as well. And I'll come to that event very shortly. Um, I'll mention that. But Cathy, getting back to sports, 
There's an argument, and Stephen makes a reasonable argument, that when we talk about, say, darts or Irish dancing or chess or whatever it is that doesn't involve a huge amount of, you know, athletic skill, that, you know, we dilute the argument. That, yes, if we're talking about weightlifting or running or, sh- you know, high jumping, okay, there's a, there's a valid argument that we can all have in a debate, but we're diluting the argument when we complain about those ones. Well, the thing about it is, I, I don't know if you have a mathematical background, but there's such a thing as um, a statistical analysis called um, a bell curve. So it's the standard, it's, it's, it's the distribution of people or, or in various categories according to like how they perform. So if you took a, sta- um, a, like a distribution of men versus women in all of those categories, including chess, you would see that the, the, the men are going to outperform the women at the extremes of that bell curve. So for even in chess, because chess is basically just intelligence, it's just pure intelligence. Well, it's mathematical um, skills, yeah, more or less. Yes, and, and actually it's IQ. So if, if, if I've just finished reading a book called The Bell Curve, and it's actually one of the things it looks at um, is if you look at the, the bell curve of female intelligence versus male intelligence, overall, in, on average, we're, we're exactly the same. But uh, in the tails at each end, so, um, so for example, there's more male geniuses, like a lot more, and there's a lot more male extremely stupid people. Um, so on the two, the two tails are... So men, men have the extremes, so a lot of us are completely they stupid or very intelligent, whereas women tend exactly. to be more in the middle, is what you're telling me, yeah. Exactly. Although there are very intelligent yeah. women, of course. Yes, of course there is, because we're talking about um, a, a, a normal distribution. So, for example, for chess, of course, you have to split it. It has to be categorised, because if you look at the, the two distributions, it'd be completely unfair, because you get, you get like 10 male geniuses, and you get one female genius, you know? And so that's just the way it works. Well, men are risk takers as well, by the way. Men are always being risk takers. When we look at stupid videos of people doing stupid things, it's usually men. It it even could be something as simple as like the impact of the menstrual cycle and our reproductive cycles on our ability to perform on a certain given day or given time of our lives. So if you talk, for example, about, say, a master's chess player, uh, and then when I'm talking about masters, not a grandmaster, but like over 40, say, somebody who's performed... So a man competing against a woman at that age between 40 and, say, 55, when a woman might be going through menopause for six or seven years, that affects her concentration, it affects her thinking skills, it affects all of that. She should only be competing against other women who may also be going through that, you know, for fairness. So even, even if you take away every single sort of athletic difference, there are still basic differences between men and women throughout our lives. Our lives are governed by our reproductive capacity as women. Our hormone cycles change over a 28-day cycle. We are roughly 28 days. We menstruate. That affects our... We have pain. It affects our ability to even control our bladders, we, where we have, you know, more urgency to go to the toilet. You still get the same amount of set toilet breaks against a man. All of those kind of things are never, ever taken into consideration when we have these discussions, but they are actually fundamental. Even the level of progesterone in your body will impact your mm. optimism or pessimism. And, 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 and I think that's a fair point. You Sorry, I, 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 win, I, want right? to, I want to come to Stephen on that. See, Stephen, you know, we talk and I talk on the radio as well, generally speaking. Last year we were talking about, you know, having, you know, breastfeeding breaks for women. Um, you know, in Russia they've introduced two days off for women who have heavy uh, menstrual cycles. You know, there's loads of things we're doing now to make the workplace better for women who obviously have a difficult time of it biologically because we don't have all the problems they have, um, apart from the fact that we're stupid sometimes. Um, so realistically, you know, if we're trying to make things all equal and all better for women and we're, you know, we're waving that kind of virtuous flag all the time, why does this go completely against that virtuous flag and say, well, actually, let's make it more difficult for women in this particular category when it comes to sports because we've got lads out there who identify as women or who want to be women and we're going to put them in with those women as well. That completely goes against everything else we're trying to do for equality. Well, we should be doing all of those things and, you know, more power to it. Maybe our governments or future governments will cop on and make a, make a few extra changes that are more beneficial for the female sex. You know, but this this argument of, you know, we're, we're, we're tipping the scales and making it unfair and unequal and unsafe, possibly, for female athletes to compete against people that were born in male bodies, uh, it doesn't. It hasn't stacked up yet, in my opinion. I could, I could be. So when, do, when know, should we wait? I, for my that opinion could how change many, on that. How many? How many women will have to be disadvantaged before you accept that it's a disadvantage? Like, uh, we, well, we all let's just look at the let's just look at the, the, the that marathon race when, that happened in the how states many where a trans woman finished nineteen thousand six hundred and something or other, and the women behind that trans woman were moaning about it. 
became 19,000th or 1900th, whichever it is, out of everybody. But that person you know? was in the wrong, they, yeah, but they, they were in the wrong category. So, so like what I'm saying is, at what point for you will the scales tip? Because you keep saying we don't know yet, we don't know yet. But what we're saying is we can predict that this is unfair. We are starting to see the, the results of this in terms of injuries and loss of opportunities for women. So for you, you don't have to answer this online, but for, for a reflective question for yourself, how many you women... You never answer anything affected? online, but anyway. How many girls would you like to have to see a penis in a changing room before it's too many? How many girls would you like to see leave their sport before it's too many? How many women would you like to see lose out on Olympic opportunities before it's too many? This is now. Now is the time to stop this before it's too many. We know what's going to happen. We, can, we have an opportunity, especially in Ireland, where we have very, very few at the moment impacted by this. We have an opportunity to actually say, hang on a minute, we value all people equally and all children equally and by the value of, of equality females must be female sports must be protected and we will do it from and, that and by the way females must be protected too because I, I, I kind of remember this story about the pro female boxer Clarissa Shields she bragged claiming she could beat pro male boxers she got knocked out in 8 seconds by an amateur yeah. So, so Stephen, yeah. you know, yeah. it's all well and good saying you can do something, but realistically, we have to be realistic. By the way, just before I let Circa go there, I do want to mention, by the way, that the Countess are having a um, an event in the RDS. When When is the event, Circa, and how can people get tickets if they want to go along to it? Yep, it's on the 27th of April from uh, 12.30 to 5.30. We're really very line of speakers, and you can get tickets if you visit our website or check out Ticket Taylor. Um, dot com or check our Twitter, uh, our Facebook, all of those kind of um, platforms, and uh, you can see it if you just look up the Countess Conference resisting ideology. And we love to see as many people as possible there. It should be a really good day. Absolutely, I'll be heading along myself uh, to have a, a, a good look. I know there's some great speakers. I know, I know, Stephen. Stephen, maybe you should Stephen head along, speaking. Stephen. <laughs> Stephen, you, you know what I mean? Might be interesting. Maybe they'll yeah, send me we'd a ticket. Love to have Stephen. Yeah. Okay. Sure, but, but Stephen, yeah. You're welcome. Just, Stephen. As, just as a, just as a, as a, an attempt to answer your question, because I have to go as well. I need to get to work. Yeah. And you know, there are there are what two three percent of people who are trans competing at any kind of high level sport across the planet. You know, does that need to? Do, I'm not saying that needs to get to ten, twenty, fifty percent to have equal representation or anything like that. I'm just saying that the people that are in these cases where they really want to compete should be allowed to compete. And if they're not allowed to compete, then the the governing bodies should create a third category for everybody. But the problem with a third category, just as an aside, because I'm not wholly against the idea of it, but the problem with it is, is trying to get anybody else who isn't trans to compete in it or to force trans people to compete in it. Because again, this becomes a segregation. It becomes a discrimination. Well, well, it, well it's kind of like the issue. It's like the suggestion that there should be a trans bathroom or a toilet. You know, I mean, you, you, you kind of don't want that either, I suppose, because the point you're making is then it segregates people. I don't get that. Well, there should, there, we already have trans bathrooms in disabled bathrooms. We also have a couple of gender neutral bathrooms in some of the newer buildings across the country. I think a gender neutral bathroom is not a bad thing, but you know, I wouldn't, I'm not terribly uncomfortable you know, using the bathroom in the but same I, space. I, but I, but I do appreciate the point Sarah is making when it comes to children or people, minors under the age of 18. You know, how many girls have to see a penis before we decide it's not a good idea anymore? How many girls see penises when they're growing up? That, that's absolute and utter nonsense. There was a case in the United Kingdom where a boy who was 15 years of age was identifying as a girl uh, demanded to use in one of the co- uh, one of the colleges that they were, were in, the female bathroom. Thankfully, they lost the case um, because the school said, no, you can't do that. You can't be just walking around, you know, female changing room with your langer hanging out. You know, that's just not appropriate. And parents, if I was the parent of a female, a young girl, I wouldn't want lads walking around with their penises hanging out in the middle of a changing room. No. It's just not appropriate, Stephen. You know, at over 18, they can decide themselves. You know what I mean? Or, uh, you know, they should be able to decide themselves. Uh, and, you know, the authority should listen to them. But under the age of 18, we have a duty to protect minors. Uh, well, I, well, I, hang on, because I want to, I, thank you, sir. I want to, I don't know whether you can say or not, Stephen, but because I want to go to Sarah as well. Sarah, hi, how are you? Uh, Hi, Niall. How are you? Go ahead, Sarah. What do you want to say? Yeah, um, just before Stephen goes, maybe I could ask him, can he name a single 
a woman who says they're a man who has taken the prize money or the trophy or the opportunities away from men. This ideology is only negatively impacting women, Niall. You're only seeing women and girls losing out. So you had um, Kim O'Brien there last month, who was an Irish pool player who forfeited to a man rather than compete against him. Um, you had um, Katie Sheldon, who missed out prize money to a man, 20-year-old Irish woman. N- none of the mainstream media here in Ireland covered it because, again, it's, it's, it's taboo. We're not, we're not allowed to cover it. This well, I know RT were dance. criticised over that. RT were criticised over the fact that they... Yeah, yeah. yeah they did dance. And so, and so only women across the world, in every country where this ideology has absolutely skyrocketed, only women are missing out. So even... Well, it, it, would be, it would be fair to point out that the majority of trans people are men who obviously identify as women. Uh, it's a smaller percentage of women who identify as men. But it, you... Obviously, it doesn't cause a biological problem because you're not going to wa- you're not going to see if a woman who identifies as a man wanting to say get into a boxing ring with a bloke. It's just not going to happen. Well, uh, but also, actually, statistically, the new cohort of trans um, people are predominantly the younger ones are predominantly young girls. Um, I think about sixty or seventy percent of the teens and twenty somethings are actually women who think they're men. They're mostly, um, as well, there's a, a, an overrepresentation of autism as well. So actually, based on that, you would expect that you're going to start seeing them. But the reality is a girl may think she's a man, cut off her breast, take hormones. Wow. They have no ability. I've seen some of those horrendous with, stories, with, horrendous stories of women yeah. who, who've detransitioned, who have regrets, and it's too late. They've already had their breasts removed. They've had surgery and had their breasts removed. It's horrendous. Exactly, and they're not taking, back to the sport topic, they're not taking prizes of um, men and they're not taking sponsorships. Why, by the way, look, why, Sarah, do, do you know why we're seeing an increase? I know social media has a huge amount to do with it, but wh- why are we seeing such an increase of young girls wanting to be boys? Now, when I was young, there were girls who were tomboys. We used to call them tomboys. You know, they'd yeah. want to play with, you know, football with the lads. They'd hang around with the lads. They'd go drinking with the lads. But most of those women, you know, after they got to about 18 or 19, yeah. started to embrace their femininity again. Yeah, well, I have two daughters and have a son, and um, boys and girls are very different. Um, my daughters, I see now the pressure they're under, kind of socially. You know, the, the the definition of a woman is this kind of hypersexualized Kardashian-esque image. It's yeah, the lipstick woman they call it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, it's been pumped at them, pumped at them, pumped at them, and I see like, you know. Well, it, they all, if you look at my 15 year old daughter and her friends, you know, they all dress the same. They all look the same. They all try and look at like each other. And then you see the other girls who maybe are, are you know, on the autistic spectrum or who can't fit in with that um, kind of mandated look. And if there's no category for them, so then they're defaulting and, and some of them are then are autistic or some of them are, are lesbian defaulting into this other category, which is, oh, well, then I must be born in the wrong body because I, I, can't, I can't see myself like that. I can't, I can't navigate that, you know, yeah. over-sexualized. And so, because there's too much competition in that, in that part or that category, there's too much competition. It's too hard. Yeah. It's too hard. And it's like my 15-year-old now, she's got skincare routine. Can I, can you know, can I just I, say something here? Yes, sorry, yeah, Kathy. Yeah, so, jump in there, Kathy. Go yeah, yeah. Just, just well, just as someone who has uh, her daughter went through this, and I, and I, I know all her friends are all trans or non-binary or whatever. So I know exactly the type of girl that gets sucked into this, and it isn't as simple as just they, they, the ones that flirt with the idea of of like not like wanting to grow up and be a woman. That's not. They're not going to stick with that idea. In fact, they're probably they, they would be trans allies, and they would probably encourage other girls to go down mm. that path. But it's the ones that are damaged in some way or vulnerable in some way. Yeah. Um, they're the ones yeah. that, that are in danger. Um, so the rest of them, it's just, the rest of them you could just say, yes, it's just, it's just like hairstyles and it's just a fashion and a fad. But, but it's, it's the ones that are vulnerable that could get sucked into this and to, like, and their lives yeah. are destroyed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, no, no their, li- their lives can be absolutely different. destroyed, yes. And, and another thing, Niall, just, just, just back to a point that Stephen was saying, you know, why don't we just let it because, you know, it's only 2% of people, this, that and the other. Like what is what, why aren't we asking the question? Why don't we just say no? What's wrong with saying no? I mean, the categories are there for a reason. They've been there forever, uh, and then this new like cult comes along, and suddenly uh, people are falling over themselves backwards to virtue signal and uh, pretend that they're all, you know they, they have this 
you know, they're, they're more advanced human beings because they can understand what trans people are. And the rest of us are just like plebs that are stuck in this kind of biological reality, you know. I, I, I think I, I do think. You know, sorry, I want to come back to Sarah on that matter. I think so, social media, Sarah, and sorry, Kathy, just got you a little bit short there. Social media plays a huge role in this because you got kids who are looking at, say, Dylan Mulvaney, for example, who's hugely successful, and I think eventually will come out. By the way, Dylan Mulvaney and say he made a fool of everybody. Uh, I think he's just doing it for the money, um, uh, and they're looking up to these idols. They they think they're idols, and they're going, well, you know, they're successful and they're getting attention. Isn't that what it's all about as well? They're getting a bit of attention and saying, you know, they used to be a, a man and now they're a woman. They're sure I could go down that road. Yeah. But in real life though, Niall, can I just say, like I went to Dundrum yes, uh, not yesterday, the day before with my daughter. It was yesterday, actually, it feels like longer ago. And so was, within about five minutes, they had spotted themselves um, four trans-identified men. Um, one fellow was about, I'd say, about six foot five. He was with his mother. Um, and they're they're absolutely terrified. And so back to the sports topic, no one's asking about how does it feel if you're a young girl and you're told you're playing with a boy now, there's a boy in the changing rooms. Like we already know when it comes to sponsorship and pay, women are paid a fraction of what men are. In the United States, they get maybe three or 4% of the total sponsorship female athletes. Um, and so um, the dropout rates of teenage girls. So, you're now injecting in to this scenario where already women and girls are at such a disadvantage financially, opportunity-wise. And again, I have a son who's 17. The opportunities for sporting participation and competitive events for him in the sports he's played his whole life in Ireland are way bigger than, than what's yeah. available to girls. Yeah, there's, right? a, there's very few specific that. sports where girls get paid the same. Tennis would be, I suppose, the best example where girls and men, men and women, earn equally at the same amount. Exactly. And like, like my son now, he's, he's, he's at elite level of 17. If he decided tomorrow he wants to play in the girls' event in the sport that he's in, he would absolutely dominate in every single of course he would. competition. Yeah. And so the point I'm trying to make, though, is about that we know there's physical differences. And, you know, it's very easy for Stephen, who will never be impacted because he's a man um, uh, and doesn't have daughters and doesn't understand what it's like to actually have a, a daughter and see her having to navigate the world but like for me, I've, you know, my 15 year old, there's boys in her school who say they're girls. Why should the girls have to go along with that? And there's also the, the um, again, there's the compelled speech, the compelled thought. You know, there's a, there's a boy put into the Irish dancing competition and all the girls have to go along with it. What if one of them doesn't feel comfortable? What if one of them says, well, that's a boy? Where is their right to object? They will be absolutely vilified and attacked. And so we're forcing this idea on all of these girls, not only do they have to compete and participate and they can't have their own thing, why can't they have their own thing? But also, they are a problem. They will be targeted if they put their hand up and say, well, that's a boy. And what gives anyone the right to tell a young child that the earth is flat and to make them go along with it? Well, 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 we're seeing that playing out in Scotland right now as we, as we speak at the moment, of course, with J.K. Rowling, uh, more or less demanding the British police or the Scottish police, yep. arrest her, uh, taunting and, them to and, arrest her. And, and by the way, she's now become an accidental campaigner. So uh, it'll be interesting yeah. to say, I, I, I'm, I'm just waiting for the day that J.K. Rowling will be standing in a dock saying, what are you accused of calling a man a man? Uh, yeah, well, well think, that'll be an interesting it time. To happen. Well, if you look at, if you look at, um, if you look at RTE actually this morning, they actually cover J.K. Rowling, and I think it's brilliant because the hate speech laws are, are coming in here and people need to understand the, the, you know, the outcomes when you bring in this compelled speech. And I know someone mentioned Enoch Burke earlier, and you're right that he's, he's in there because he won't go along with the court order. Um, and, and I wish he'd played it differently and just gone, gone through the, the normal process, the grievance process. Yeah. Um, you know, so we haven't had some legal challenges. No, no, no. I, I did say in relation to Enoch Burke, you know, 10 out of 10 for perseverance, but I just think he's doing it wrong. You know what I mean? But 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 in saying that, that's, he has his way of doing it. I'm not going to disagree with That's his way of wanting to do it. He yeah. could walk out of jail in the morning if he wanted to. And then he could take all the yeah. legal routes that he wants to, you know, to stand up for I his right. Yeah, I wish he would. I wish he would. But, you know, my point around the sport and the girls' participation is, you know, that's, if that's one of my daughters now and a boy turns up in the changing room and, uh, or on the pitch with them, I will. I speak openly in front of them about this. 
they have every right to put their hand up and go, I don't feel comfortable. I don't want to be in a changing room undressing with a boy. I don't want to be put at risk playing no. sport, physical tech sport with a boy. Where, wh- like, wh- how have we gotten here? We, we never even got equality for girls of equal opportunity, equal pay. In, in but I, I don't understand how women, because women are a very powerful voice in this world, right? And, and believe me, because most of us are either married to them, us men are either married to them or we have a girlfriend or whatever, right? So we're, they're a very powerful voice. They're not quiet. They're not shy about saying things. They fought for over 100 years for rights. Those rights are now yeah. being taken away from them. And yet they we're are. seeing women, and it is women as well, who are agreeing with yeah. us. And I just find it bizarre when I hear a woman standing up for the right for a man to walk in with his penis hanging out into a girl's changing yeah. room. And I hear a woman standing up for that man's right. I'm blown away by that. Well, I don't know. Did you see last week um, there was two men who say they're women. They were retired civil servants. Um they were hosted by the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs on a, a YouTube. I'll send you the video for an hour and a half. An interview with a man. There's three men sitting on a stage, two of them with wigs on. Um, and they were talking about their transition, I'm doing that in quotes, in the department. Uh, it, one had worked in the WRC and the other one worked somewhere else, I can't remember. Um, and they openly talked about how they had gotten HR, even before they transitioned, to make sure that the office, um, you know, to, to go around and make sure there wouldn't be a problem if she, and then he corrected himself, he said they objected. So it's, it, I think a lot of women have gone along with it out of fear, right? Um, if you have situations, civil servants like that, where, where they're openly, and they were laughing, at, I have to send you this link, they started talking about when they went into the ladies, and he was like, oh, they went into the ladies, and I expected sparkles, and it was disgusting, and they're all laughing. I'm like, here is a man sitting up on stage being platformed by our government, bragging and giggling and laughing about having HR support him in silencing women so that he can go into the women's changing rooms and the women's toilets. Um, you know, no, 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 I, I, I get you. And, and I, I just, it blows me away, Sarah, that women support that, by the way. It's bad enough that men support it, but that women support it. But actually, I think, do you know what? I think less men actually support that than women. I think women are the champions of all this, which is shocking. So. <laughs> well, hang on. Just stay there for a second, Sarah. Let me go to Morris. Morris, hi. Yeah. No, I'll help you doing all right. Get back to the original question. I've only got about 10 minutes left. I have to go to Jackie and Angela yeah. as well. But in, in relation to the, 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 the sporting aspect of it, the darts, the Irish dancing more recently, which are kind of flimsy kind of sports because really they don't involve a huge amount of athletic skill, but in saying that there is differences between the sexes. Do you believe they should be allowed to identify as women and enter those sports? Well, I watched a programme of... Um a swimming meet that was going on for women that wanted to qualify for either the Europeans or the Olympics. And the women were complaining about a man being in the qualifying sessions. And the camera cut to the guy. Jesus Christ, he was absolutely massive. So, uh, was that was that Leah Thomas, I think, wasn't it? Yeah. I, I didn't even listen for names. I just saw this giant of a man in a black leotard. Who, ide- who identified as a woman, yeah. Who identified yes, as a woman. Yes, yes. And they pulled out of the competition. They didn't want to qualify against the man. Because so why were they? Why, why could you can't yeah, exactly. compete against that? Exactly. Well, why are they allowing it? Anyway, then there was another person down in Kerry who was either at a darts tournament or a, a pool tournament, and they pulled out because they got drawn against. They, beat, they won all their section, and then she said, I'm not going into the next round because I don't want to play a man. And she has the right to do that. Well, well, well you, you're saying she has the right to do that, but unfortunately, at the moment, it looks like she doesn't have the right to do that, or they don't have the right to do that, because the, the governing bodies of these organisations are allowing men who identify as women enter the competition under the, the guise of a woman. Hmm. And, and here's another one for you. My son pointed this one out to me about a, a weightlifting competition in Canada, and this guy that identified as a woman went in and blew all the competition away and uh, set new, seven new world records in that weight division. I know. That women could never lift. And, know, and, and, we, and a woman will never beat that record. Never beat never, that record. Never, never. Not in a million years. He came in, he done the damage and he fecked off, you know. So I think, look, and I, I, I thought Stephen was a little bit dismissive of women when the fact that a woman has a baby was brought up. Women are sacred, in my opinion, because they bring the next generation into the world. A man can't do that. We contribute through the making of the baby, but the woman births the child into the world. 
that's gifted to her. Mm. That's a special person. You can't be just dismissing people. Oh, so what? She can have a baby. He wouldn't be here only for a woman, would he? This is true. We all have mothers. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> men's sport is for men's sports. And no, I'm old school. I'm a dragon. I'm going down to the pub tonight for a game of darts with the lad. End of story. <laughs> well, okay. Thanks. Thanks for that, Morris. Please, the uh, Let me go to Jackie. Jackie, hi. How are you? Well, I, I'm with Morris. <laughs> I'm definitely are you going? Morris you're going for you're going for the game of darts too, are you? Yeah, okay, yeah, with the lads, hundred percent. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. I mean, Jackie, should, is there any sport where you know where there is categories where you know men who identify as women should be allowed to play? Uh, I I reckon that once you start giving away sections, be it the Irish dancing, be it uh, darts or whatever, it then it just multiplies and suddenly it's everywhere. So it's a point of and principle, now, in other words. Yeah, yeah, it's a point of principle. And the other side of this is there seems to be, and, and you were talking about social media, social media is driving this and certain agendas in governments are driving this. But if you take uh, it within a competition and you have someone there who is identifying as a woman and you have whoever is, you know, the judges of that, they're kind of going, well, maybe we should be kind of seen to be you know, kind of pushing this along. And suddenly that person is winning certain competitions. And then you wonder, is there funding supplied for organizations who actually have transgender people within their clubs or whatever as well? I'm, I'm just curious. About Diversity that. You know, funding, the, like, well, I know, yeah, I know in, Gra- in Great Britain know. they get a credit score. Yeah, you know that, um, what was it, um, that organization that Sarah will help me out here, I think. Uh, the organisation who was involved in going around getting large companies to print booklets off on diversity and do videos for their staff and encourage the staff to wear little badges with their pronouns on it, that they get these kind of social credit of some description. Their company, you know, gets the LGBT, you know, mark of approval. Um, I'm not too sure that... Yeah. Name, yeah, I'm trying to remember the name of the organisation that was, that was doing it. It could have been Stonewall, 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 I think, yeah. Yeah, similar to the political end of it, where you have parties who get... Uh, a fair a fact check for uh, taking on um, non-Irish as to be a representative in a local area. So mm. they, get, they get serious funding to do that. So it's a buy-in. But the, the main problem here is that you're not allowed to talk about this openly. I've been looking at J.K. Rowling's um, tweets and stuff, and, and now she's my hero. But <laughs> the... The, the fact that we're gagged now, in fairness to you, you're, you're, you're putting it out there and you're letting people speak on both sides. Um, so that's one point. The other point is the, the girls or women should be able to decide if this is going to be allowed or not allowed. It should be the, the, the competitors and that they should be the ones that should dictate this, not, not the, the governing bodies because there's so much other politics attached to that. But the girls themselves, if they are not comfortable with uh, a, a, a man who's identifying as a woman being in the competition, well, then it should be a case then that it's not allowed. And let's have a, an actual trans uh, competition, a separate entity altogether. Yeah, well, they had, they, they had have. suggested that, but I think Stephen made a fair point in relation to that. If they had a trans oh. category, there wouldn't be enough people in it. Do you know something? Because, you know, there's only 2% of the population or whatever claim to be transgender or gender. But then why spoil, why spoil this on other people? Hmm. I mean, and, well, and well I don't know why yeah. women are the victims of all this, because men are not being the victims of all this, because you don't see, you know, women who identify as men infiltrating male categories, because there'd be no point in that. Yeah, well, I, I, I say, as, and just as another example, I, I, we were in a venue there a while back, and on the door, uh, the toilet door was male and female. Mm. Now, and uh, uh, one of the times we're in it, I noticed uh, women come and running out because some guy had gone into it. Yeah, and that. So the next time around, I taped the the man from the female. So the, it was only the female sign. Yeah, and then people were coming up to me saying, "Thank you for doing that." 
I mean, look, I've no, I've no problem with a small cafe or restaurant having a single unisex toilet because they physically Definitely. don't have the space yeah. for two toilets. That's, That's perfectly fine. Yeah. But, it, but in an organisation, yeah. you know, in a workplace or wherever where you have bathrooms and bathroom space, they should yeah. be separated for the purposes of dignity because people want yeah. privacy. And I completely agree. And by the way, can I just also and mention, before, before I go to Angela, on a side note, I'm going to start a one-man campaign to ban urinals. <laughs> <laughs> I think urinals are the most disgusting, horrible, smelly, <laughs> antiquated notions ever. I think they're just, I just, urinals just, what is it about lads wanting to stand there with their mickeys in their hand? I just don't understand it. it it's just horrendous. It's undignified in every single way. Uh, sorry, sorry, that was That's just a side note. different show. Yeah, it is. <laughs> stay there, Jackie, stay there. Angela, hi, how are you? I'll go against that because where will the ladies go to the toilet when the men are standing at the urinals and the ladies' toilet is full? You haven't gone to the Jackson <laughs> urinal, Angela, have you? I did see a girl doing it one day, by the way. He's right beside me. No, I haven't, but I, I've gone into the men's toilet to go when there's you no. Know, I was I was in room. Club M one night many years ago working, and I was in the Jacks, and I'm standing there at the urinal. And the next minute, a girl comes running in, lifts her dress, and into the urinal she goes. Good woman. Yeah, great aim. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> sorry, Angela, getting, least, getting back to the sports very quickly. I've got five minutes here. But getting back to the sports, does it matter what the sport is or should men or who identify as women be just blanket banned from entering women's sports? Blanket banned from entering women's sports. As I said, I know a female prison officer in, in a prison in Ireland, right? And they now have a transgender prison officer. So a man who is now as a woman demanding all the rights, you know, I need, I should be able to go into the women's changing rooms. I should be able to do it. But not only that, he is a cyclist um, uh, competitively. And now he's winning a lot of the women's races Mm. because he's now cycling against women. And that is wrong. No, because male, male cyclers hold the records and they're faster than women. Yeah. Yeah, of course, like. But, I mean, the thing is, like, I, I, I know somebody whose son, um, uh, you know, transitioned into a girl and she's now a girl and she's a beautiful looking girl, but she's not out there going, you know, I need this, I need this, I need this. She's not. Well, on the one hand, you're giving out. Hang on. On the one hand, you're you're accepting that you know somebody whose son transitioned into a girl, and now she, yes. you're saying to me she's a beautiful girl. Uh, but on the other hand, yeah. you're not. Well, then then you're kind of being a little bit hypocritical because you're accepting no, that know, person, but you're not accepting the other person who wants to do the cycling. I personally don't I'm believe a man can ever become a woman. I'm by the way, not, I'm not accepting competitiveness. I am not. I am do you not believe a man can become a woman? No. Well then, why did, well, then why, well, then why did you say I know somebody who's, you know, transitioned and now they're a beautiful young girl? Well, so you obviously I, do I, believe I, it. I, what I've always said, Niall, is if a fella wants to dress as a girl or a girl wants to dress as a fella, fine. But you give away all your rights. And don't expect to be treated as a woman. Not treated as a woman, but to have the same rights as a woman, to do what a woman does. Don't expect that. You want to dress as a woman... Fine, happy out, but don't expect. To Are they a woman? Toilet. Are they a woman? If somebody, if somebody, no, of course they're not. Okay, no, they can get boobs. And... They can get whatever <clears throat> they want. Jackie, do you no. do you accept that somebody can change their their sex or their gender? Do you do you think they can? Uh, I I'm sorry, I don't. Oh, okay. And and I was just going to make a point there in the schools. This is where it's all happening from the national schools up, and there's a serious problem going on here where this this is being pushed. So much like that people, until they get to 18 years of age, that they really know their bodies and know their own minds. But this thing of five-year-olds, 12-year-olds... disgusting. And then yeah. saying... You, it, no, it, no, it, no, 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 all that is is brainwashing. It's, it, it's, I, you know, it is indoctrination. Yeah. Listen, lads, ladies, Angela, sorry for getting you in at the last minute there. Thank you very much indeed as well, Jackie. Uh, lots of people, by the way, texting in. I've got some WhatsApp voice notes here that I just want to pop on for you just very quickly before I give you a bit of information before we go. Let me just turn that up there. There we go. Noel, if you ask me, it's basically legal cheating. That's what it is. It's cheating, if you ask me. Cheers, pal. And, uh, 
Also, I want to play this voice now because I mentioned at the start of the show, by the way, that Lewis from Lucan was on to us and he wanted to raise awareness that it was World Autism Day. So he sent us in a little message. So I just want to play this for you as well, for Lewis. Dear Niall, this is Lewis here. I have autism and having autism doesn't really like bother me much. But like with me, like with my autism, I have Asperger's syndrome. Like having it, it doesn't really affect me, even though I'm 21. Like it affects me a tiny bit when I'm flying on planes. Like I'm afraid of flying on planes. I have like really bad like emotions when I'm going on planes. I just can't deal with planes and flights. Like I delayed him like for over two hours of flight. And yeah, it always happens. So I always have a panic attack when I'm trying to go on, go on a plane with my family and stuff and yeah and like autism like puts me into like this box like it doesn't put me into a box i just want to say this to anyone that has autism and that is finding it difficult don't let it like define you who you are because you're you're just you being like autism you're just different like having autism you're different t- towards anyone else and like me, the way I have it, it suits me. I like having autism personally because I love it more than everything else. I mean, it makes my day and I have no filter when it comes to autism. I say what I want and I just blame it all on my autism. And that's what I like, Niall. Anyway, so I hope you are all well, Niall. And I'm loving the podcast. So anyway, see you. Bye. Happy Tuesday and happy four day week. Bye. And happy World Autism Day. That's Lewis, by the way. I love the way he said he uses his autism as an excuse. And he's right. Embrace it. He said he just feels different. And that's perfectly fine, too. You can feel any way you want to. By the way, loads of messages, by the way, coming in about today's topic. Thanks for that, Lewis, by the way. Loads of messages coming in about today's topic. Uh, give trans athletes their own separate sporting categories where they're playing, uh, the playing field is equal. Well, we mentioned that already, but there wouldn't be enough of them. They wouldn't be able to compete to be able to each other, and that would be kind of hilarious too, wouldn't it? Uh, Lorenzo says, I think it's disgraceful to let men compete against women. Uh, Maureen says, Stephen has no argument here. He needs to cop on and realise women exist. He does my head in. Uh, he does a lot of people's head in. Uh, the black dog, uh, but we have to get the other version and the other, obviously, opinion on the show as well. The black dog says, uh, flatly, my dear, I don't river dance. Stephen says, uh, no, it's absurd. What's the point in having categories that they're not adhered to? And um, Alien says, no, they're cheaters and being affirmed by people who have no sense of what's right. Cheaters, cheaters and more cheaters. Can I mention as well, just in relation to we were talking earlier on to the Countess uh, website and we were talking to Circa and she was mentioning, somebody said to me, when is the event on again? It's called Resisting Ideology and it's on in the RDS in Dublin on the 27th of April. Tickets are available now from the Countess website or indeed you can go to tickettailor.com. That's tickettailor.com. Uh, at the event, by the way, there will be lots of speakers. Uh, I will be there. I won't be speaking, but I'll be there. I'm, go- I'm going along just because I want to listen to it myself. And Kelly J. Keane, better known as the Posey Parker, will be there as well uh, speaking at the event. Um, so I'm sure there will be a little bit of controversy around that because there always is everywhere she goes, isn't there? There's always protesters outside saying, no, you're not allowed to talk because we demand that we're the only ones that can talk and anybody else with a different opinion is not allowed to speak because they usually go everywhere, don't they? The You know, that kind of, the woke people. Anyway, so it'll be an amazing event, an amazing lineup. And as I said, Kelly J. Keane, uh, the Bosey Park will be there. And it's the Countess are organising it. If you go to the Countess.ie, you can get tickets there as well. By the way, it's called Resisting Ideology. And there will be a lot of speakers at it, by the way. So please go along. I'm sure it'll be a good event. Uh, well organised by Leisha, by the way. It was on, with us last week, Leisha De Bruyne. Thank you to everybody who got involved in today's show.